This conference will now be recorded. Again, thank you everyone for joining us today with respect for everyone's time. All lines will be muted throughout today's presentation. Should you have any questions, we ask that you use the chat room feature and we will make every attempt to answer all your questions. Again, thank you for joining us. Pete? Great, uh, thank you, Jen. At this time, uh, I'd like uh, our chairman of the board, Rob Lord, to welcome everyone and call the meeting to order. All right, and we will officially call the meeting to order. Um, uh, I wanna thank everyone for joining us today um, in this virtual format. Um, uh, and uh, as, as Jen alluded to, um, you know, we're gonna mute all the lines. Um, but uh, if, if your line is open, if we keep our, our, our uh, uh, the background noise to a minimum, we all know how that can be in these sorts of meetings now. Um, in the interest of time and respectful everybody's schedule, first we'll just recognize the elected officials uh, who I understand are joining us today uh, from St. Lucie County, Linda Bartz, um, uh, Commission Vice Chair Chris Zadowski, uh, St. Lucie <coughs> County Appraiser Michelle Franklin uh, from the School Board of St. Lucie County, Catherine Hensley, uh, from the city of Port St. Lucie, Jolene Court Caraballo and Stephanie Morgan. Um, and um, it is um, also my privilege to recognize our executive committee. We just had a meeting uh, that includes me, um, Chris Fogel, Richard Houghton, as Lena Siegel, John Tompak, and Pete Tesh. Um, uh, and um, it is also my honor to welcome Dr. Tim Moore, the president of Indian River State College. Uh, who will participate on our board of directors. Um, uh, Pete, I'll turn it back over to you for a few minutes. Thank you, Rob. Uh, at this time, I'd like to uh, announce our new investors. Uh, welcome and thank you all for taking time to join us today. I want to thank our new partners for their investment and support, uh, particularly during these challenging times. I'd like to encourage each of you to get to know our new investors and welcome them to the EDC. They include Florida Development Finance Corporation, Bill Spivey, Atasca Construction, Sandra Pabon, Place of Hope, Treasure Coast, Jamie Bond, St. Lucie Habitat for Humanity, Bob Calhoun, Total Real Estate Consultants, Carolyn Nemzek, Treasure Coast, Regional Planning Council, Thomas Lanahan. We Venture Women's Business Center at Florida Tech, Bisc College of Business, Amler Bachelor, the World Trade Center of Palm Beach, Al Zuccaro. And uh, we have there on the screen uh, the logos of uh, our great new partners. Uh, moving on to uh, an update on Recover St. Lucie. On September 28th, St. Lucie County rolled out phase two of Recover St. Lucie Small Business Assistance Grants to provide economic relief to small businesses impacted by COVID-19. Grants up to $10,000 do not have to be repaid and will be allocated to qualifying businesses with one to 25 employees and total revenue of less than 2 million. Funding is available to businesses economically injured due to the pandemic and mandated to close due to COVID-19. They include small businesses in the hardest hit industries, such as hospitality, retail, entertainment, food and beverage, and personal services. Grants may be used to cover expenses during a forced closure and incur to safely reopen. Grant funds can be used to cover mortgage, rent, utilities, reopening costs, and new operational expenses needed to ensure safety measures are in place. Grant funds will not be approved to replace lost revenue. EDC partnered with the Boys and Girls Club in a grassroots effort to distribute Recover St. Lucie Business Assistance Grants information directly to small businesses impacted by COVID-19 uh, via face-to-face -face visits in the community. 18 from the Kids Club at Percy Peak Teen Center continue to meet businesses in Fort Pierce and disseminate information. The partnership adds uh, to the team's understanding of business challenges, leadership development, and civic responsibility. 
and a shout out to Stacy Storms uh, for her uh, great efforts in uh, coordinating this with the Boys and Girls Club. So for those uh, companies that are interested um, in the grant process, please visit recoverstlucy.org and there the guidelines and eligibility requirements, uh, checklist of documents are all on there to complete the online application. Uh, phase three uh, and the final phase is expected to open around October 19th. So uh, please give us a call uh, if you have any questions about St. Lucie Recovers. So Rob, we appreciate uh, your commitment to economic development uh, in St. Lucie. And we want to thank you and uh, Cleveland Clinic Martin Health for uh, generously uh, sponsoring today's meeting as well as providing some really exciting updates on where Cleveland Clinic is today. So uh, as we mentioned, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Rob and then Rob is going to introduce our uh, guest speakers. So as many of you know, Rob Lord, uh, president of Cleveland Clinic Martin Health. Rob joined Martin Health back in 1998 as vice president and chief legal officer and served as senior vice president and COO starting in 2014 and then ended up uh, as president. Beginning in 2012, Rob played a pivotal role in the development of Tradition Hospital where he was named senior VP, systems facilities management and Tradition Hospital campus leader. He was responsible for, for the construction and opening of Tradition Hospital. He was also involved in the transaction that created Clinic uh, Research and Innovation Center, uh, uh, affectionately known as Frick, and that is now located in what was formerly known as the VGTI building. A graduate of Stetson University College of Law and Florida State University, Rob holds board certification as a healthcare executive for the American College of Healthcare Executives. The Florida Bar has also recognized him as a board certified specialist in health law. A resident of the area since childhood, Rob has been active in many community organizations in both St. Lucie and Martin counties. As you know, Rob is chair of the EDC board and has also uh, been nominated several times for the EDC Leadership Award. Rob, thank you so much for all that you do for the EDC, and I'm gonna turn it back to you, sir. Well, thank you very much. Can, can we go back to that pic, those pictures for just a second for our audience? Back one slide. I just wanna point out, you know, how much better everybody else's picture was than mine. We can just skip that. Um, <laughs> how much younger Dr. Petri and Dr. Gack look than, than, than I do. Uh, to all the members of the EDC, thank you so much. We're very proud to, to, to sponsor this event. We thought uh, uh, that it was time that we try to do something where we get together. It's been so long. Uh, I miss our luncheons together. I know we all do, um, but to get some sense of normalcy and we wanted to try, hopefully we'll give you a presentation today. Uh, that will let you know some things that are going on in the community and healthcare, a little bit about COVID and, um, and, and, and a little bit about what we're doing with um, uh, the Florida Research and Innovation Center, which relates to what we're do, dealing with with COVID. Uh, first though, let me uh, uh, just give a, a brief uh, uh, summary introduction of, of our, uh, our, my colleagues that are with me today. Uh, Dr. Fernando Petri is the Chief Medical Officer at the Cleveland Clinic. Um, he joined us in uh, November of 2014. He's he is uh, a very seasoned professional and held several senior leadership positions prior to joining our organization. Uh, he serves as vice president and chief medical officer of Haven Hospice in Gainesville. Uh, prior to that, he was a hospitalist um, uh, and regional medical director at St. Lucie Medical Center and Longwood Regional Trauma and, and Heart Center. Uh, he's a graduate of Nova Southeastern Oste uh, College of Osteopathic Medicine, uh, uh, completed his internship at Walter Reed uh, uh, Army Hospital Medical Center, which we've heard a little bit about recently in the news, 
uh, did his residency at Memorial Health University um, at the Medical College in Georgia, also attended the University of Miami, which I have forgiven him for, uh, where he received his MBA in healthcare administration, and he is board certified in family medicine. Um, Fernando's a dear friend and a great member of our executive team. Uh, he's responsible for the overall operations of quality, um, case management, utilization review, and he's a resource to every member of our medical staff in credentialing, reappointment, and peer review. Um, also with us today, uh, joining us in just a little bit, will be Dr. Michaela Gack. Uh, Dr. Gack is uh, the uh, scientific director at the Florida Research and Innovation Center. Um, she uh, uh, was a professor of uh, microbiology uh, and the chair of uh, the Committee on Microbiology at the University of Chicago, one of the nation's foremost academic institutions. Uh, she is a renowned virologist. Uh, she has an extensive background in microbiology and infectious disease. Um, interestingly, her research focuses on the immune system's response to viruses. I think we can all understand how that might be really relevant in today's world. Um, an essential step in developing a safe and effective antivirals and vaccines. So uh, right now is a time where, where her skills are, are um, uh, critical to our entire world. Uh, she's done extensive research on uh, immune evasion by dengue, influenza, and Zika viruses in the past. Um, she is a, a, a remarkably talented and, and honored physician. She's received the Merck Irving uh, Seagal Memorial Award from the American Society of Microbiology in 2014. Uh, she's twice been on Germany's list of top 40 under 40 scientists. And in 2017, uh, she received the, the Velsec uh, Prize for Creative Promise in Biomedical Research. Um, again, if you have questions during the course of this, uh, we'll uh, ask that you use the chat feature and, uh, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll move forward. If we can move forward to the that slide, thank you. Um, so as everybody knows, in January of 2019, we joined the Cleveland Clinic. And... Um, uh, that is one of the most recognized and awarded uh, healthcare organizations in the world. We're very proud that uh, they sought us out. Um, uh, the worldwide pandemic that we've gone through has not changed the, the trajectory of where we are or where we're going. Um, we believe everybody deserves world-class healthcare, and we are intent on providing that on the Treasure Coast. Uh, we're coming up in 2021 on the uh, centennial anniversary, the 100-year anniversary of the Cleveland Clinic, and uh, we will have a lot of celebrations scheduled throughout 2021, and you can expect a variety of events. Uh, we do have some news to announce. Uh, Dr. Connor Delaney uh, has uh, joined Cleveland Clinic Florida as its new CEO. Uh, some of you uh, may have met Dr. Will Barsoom. Uh, Dr. Barsoom has... Uh, uh, is pursuing some other opportunities and we're excited for him. Uh, he's still uh, on the staff of the Cleveland Clinic and doing his clinical work here, uh, but we're very privileged to have Connor Delaney joining us. Um, uh, and uh, let me just tell you a little bit about him. He is the uh, uh, past chairman of the Department of Digestive Disease and Surgery or the, at the Institute for that at the main campus. Um, he's uh, a world-renowned colorectal surgeon um, and was responsible for colorectal surgery, gastroenterology, and hepatology um, uh, throughout the Cleveland Clinic. Um, he has uh, more than 30 years of experience, a tremendous amount of, uh, uh, of leadership experience. Uh, he is also a, an Irishman. He's from Dublin. Um, uh, I um, uh, have had the privilege of getting to know him a little bit, and I think you're all going to enjoy uh, him and his leadership very, very much. Next slide, please. Uh, for the, uh, uh, our organization, there's uh, about uh, 315 hospitals, I think, as the last count I saw in the state of Florida. Um, uh, our, our facilities here locally were ranked number 28 uh, in the state out of those 315, with particularly high scoring in heart failure, colon cancer surgery, uh, pulmonary disease, and, and in hip replacement. Uh, next slide. Um, safety is our first priority. I want to assure every one of you, and I'm, and I'm sure 
um, if uh, if uh, my colleagues from uh, Lawnwood and St. Lucie Medical Center were, were, were on the phone with us or are on the phone, I, I, I'm confident I can represent this for them as well. Um, uh, we, we are all doing everything we can to make our hospitals safe. Our, uh, our 20 outpatient locations in our three hospitals uh, are safe. There is no evidence of any uh, transmission, any visitors or patients that's occurred within the hospital. We've changed a lot of what we do and how we do it uh, due to COVID. Um, and um, I think that's going to become more challenging to be uh, very candid with you um, as we move into the flu season. Um, it, it is up to us uh, to, to deal with uh, this more effectively. Um, uh, I assure you that the coronavirus is as serious today as it has ever been, um, but we are more prepared now than we were uh, initially, and, and we're ready to, um, uh, to uh, deal with whatever comes our way. Uh, but would ask uh, that everyone uh, continue uh, social distancing, mask wearing, and, and uh, uh, good hand hygiene. Um, with that, um, I previously introduced Dr. Petri. Uh, I'd like for him to share some things about what we're doing to keep our patients, our caregivers, and our community healthy uh, during the pandemic. Uh, Fernando. Thank you, Rob. So um, what we're doing in response to COVID-19 is uh, we have a, a, a type of visitor policy that is uh, adaptive. It's adaptive to the environment and adaptive to the numbers of cases that we have within this in the state. Um, it is a more open policy when our numbers are down less to below three to 2% positivity rate. When they were up in the uh, five to 6% range, um, we were in a more restrictive uh, policy. And so here you see the, um, the screen shows you the range. It goes from purple, which is more restrictive to yellow, which is less restrictive. We are currently at red. That red, um, we are able to um, still have some visitors for patients that are negative, that are COVID-19 negative. For those that are positive, unfortunately, we can't have visitors because of the potential for contamination. But we have um, opened things up a little bit in the emergency departments. If patients come in, they are allowed a visitor. Um, definitely for prenatal appointments, we are allowed a visitor. Labor and delivery, everyone is allowed one visitor, whether they were positive or negative. Uh, for peds, it's very important that, pedi that pediatric patients are accompanied by their parents. Um, and, and so those things have not changed, but uh, we in are looking forward to the potential uh, removal of some of these restrictions and to open up a little bit more the potential for visitors and for caregivers for certain patients to come in. But again, our um, our, our screening process is developed to protect not only the patients and the families, but also all our caregivers. Next slide. In response to helping the community, what we are doing is we're continuing to work with our local state officials in implementing a response to COVID-19. We've had more than 42,000 people tested since March. Uh, 22,000 of those were through the drive-throughs. and we still have the drive-throughs here at Martin North and at St. Lucie West at our outpatient center. Uh, we have developed teams to work with nursing homes to provide testing. We actually have a strike team that went into some of the nursing homes and assisted living facilities here in Martin County and in St. Lucie County to assist when there were um, a variety of positive patients. And so that strike team went in not only to provide testing, but also to assist the staff how to learn to put on PPE, the protective personal equipment, and how to care for patients that were potentially infected. We're also working with school districts on reopening, and we have been instrumental in the testing of students and the uh, staff and teachers that have come out of the schools that might be positive, and in the uh, closing of some of those classes where they've had some positive patients. Uh, we're working together with the Florida Department of Health and also Martin County School District and St. Lucie County School District. Next slide. In terms of supporting our caregivers, we have an employee assistance program that assists our caregivers with um, stress. So a caregiver that complains that they're having difficulty at work, issues that they need to uh, speak to someone, have a, have a person um, maybe provide 
mental health assistance, they can enter our employee assistance program. We also have a hardship fund for those folks that need financial assistance. And we also have support housing. So uh, many times the caregivers may be infected and cannot socially isolate at home, potentially due to having uh, young or elderly parents and uh, family members. So what we do is we're able to give them support housing so that they can uh, stay 14 days quarantined outside of their family and not infect anybody. We're also getting a lot of support from the community. And, and I have to say that the overwhelming number of donations of food, um, masks, uh, visors, the, the uh, safety goggles, face shields that we've gotten from members in the community that went out and did this on their own was just enormous. And so uh, we still continue to get a lot of donations and we are constantly thankful for the folks in the community. It was, um, again, you know, these things wax and wane. It was huge in the beginning and things have sort of died out right now, but I think mostly because people are trying to get back to normal, but we still um, on occasion get some folks to come in here. In terms of our trends here in Florida, the graph on the left is a, a number of new cases, positive cases, and you, as you can see, it's sort of up and down, but if you uh, were to sort of track a line there, it does have a downward trend, and we are seeing less positive cases as also, and also less patients inside the hospital. The graph on the right is showing you the uh, resident death rate by the date of death, and so that also, as you can see, is on a downward trend. And so we are starting to see some positive outlook right now in Florida. Next one. When we look at the uh, tr the cases at Martin Hospitals, this is the trend case for Martin North. As you can see, there is a slight uptick, uh, but it is trending down. Uh, currently, there's about uh, 18 patients overall at Martin North Hospital, with only about six of them currently in the intensive care unit and the remainder being in a non-intensive care unit setting. So we, we are still seeing a stabilization now, it's flattened. Uh, we had a, about a high of 50 back in July here at Martin North when we were at the height of this, when it first uh, really started to take hold within the community. But uh, we have seen this sort of flattening of the curve recently, and this has kind of become the new norm here at Martin North. Next slide. In St. Lucie County, a similar trend, um, a high there was about the 50s back in July. And then of course, once we had mask mandates in place in both St. Lucie and Martin County, we did see a, a nice downward trend. We're now currently right here where we are about 13 patients in the uh, facility with only about four of them right now in the intensive care unit and nine in a non-intensive care setting. So uh, we still continue to take care of patients predominantly in a non-ICU setting, mostly because we don't want to intubate these patients due to the fact that it is, takes a very long time then to get them off the ventilator. And they seem to do actually much better if they just maintain their oxygenation levels without the assistance of a ventilator. Next one. The best practices that we have, just as Rob mentioned, it is utilize a mask, do social distancing, do not congregate in uh, groups greater than 10, 10 people and to frequently wash our hands. Um, I can't stress the importance of, of doing this simple, these simple acts. Um, masking has definitely shown to reduce our overall infection rate here in Martin and St. Lucie County. And we've seen this throughout the nation. Um, in those areas that uh, do not mask, we've seen outbreaks. Uh, and we've seen this recently within the White House of uh, those folks that were involved in a uh, White, lawn, White House uh, lawn garden event all became positive within you know, a matter of days of each other. And it is because there was no masking and no social distancing. It is not a political statement. It's, it's unfortunate that we have to uh, co be concerned about politics when we're talking about a medical illness, but it, it just is truly a public health issue that we have to deal with. And so. Um, if we can do these small things, I think we can go a long way in protecting one another. Next slide, please. And if you are feeling ill, by all means, it is important to contact your primary care doctor. Uh, we have implemented virtual visits for all our providers. We were um, 
leading virtual visits within the Cleveland Clinic, Florida region at the onset of uh, coronavirus. We were also at the height of, uh, of coronavirus doing about 80% of our primary care visits done virtually that were appropriate to be done virtually. And now we're trying to settle back down to the norm, which is about a 20% rate for virtual visits for all our primary care doctors. Uh, granted, there are some specialties that cannot do virtual visits just because um, they require more intensive physical examination or in-person uh, visits, but uh, we believe that the virtual visits are going to help our patients right now uh, to prevent them from coming in and potentially infecting other patients, but then also giving them some ease at home that they don't have to get into a car and drive to their physician's clinic. And so with that, I turn it back over to Rob to talk about our uh, service line updates. Rob? Thank, thank you, Fernando. Appreciate it very much. Uh, just want to touch on a couple of things before I jump into this. Uh, Fernando mentioned that we have a caregiver uh, hardship fund, a philanthropic fund uh, for our own caregivers. We have also established a philanthropic fund, uh, uh, virtually identical, uh, but has also been funded by generous members of our community to support um, uh, people who work in fire rescue, law enforcement, uh, health department staff, and other first responders. Um, so if you know someone who runs in, who falls into that category and due to COVID, uh, they have run into a hard time and, and they need some help uh, to get over a rough spot. Uh, there is a, a fund that the Cleveland Clinic has set up uh, uh, for those people specifically, and we're very, very proud of that. Um, I would also note uh, and follow up to what Dr. Petra just said. Uh, here, here's the reality of what happened uh, as, as I see it uh, with COVID admissions. Uh, and you can't rely on the Martin North and South because that doesn't tell you St. Lucie County residents versus Martin County residents necessarily. Plenty of people from Palm City go to tradition. And there are many times we'll take a pa patient to North because we have a particular service capability there, but they are a, site, they are a, a, a resident of St. Lucie County. But basically following up what, what uh, Fernando just said, um, we peaked out uh, at a little over 50 patients for St. Lucie County um, uh, just after uh, the, the the local county ordinance uh, went in, or the, the the I believe executive order of, uh, of, of the county administrator went into effect, um, and that's what we would expect to see. And we've seen a steady decline from there, uh, now down into the um, uh, low teens. Um, uh, uh, and, and sometimes a little bit lower than that. Um, and that's been a steady state for the past several weeks for us at our facility. I can't speak for Longwood or St. Lucie Medical Center, but we have seen a, a dramatic reduction. We can't prove any causal relationship, but but I do think that, um, that the evidence is, is becoming clearer and clearer that that, that wearing a mask is, is a good way to prevent both uh, uh, transmitting the infection and getting it yourself. Uh, we do have some very exciting news um, uh, that we're, uh, I'm excited to share with you. Um, uh, our, our two uh, cardiothoracic surgeons, Dr. Savage and Dr. Beecher, are now doing robotic lung procedures and uh, mitra uh, clips. Um, uh, again, a, an exciting advancement um, in, in the use of robotic surgery. Um, uh, Dr. Cousineau joined us uh, from Cleveland in March, and um, uh, we are starting our own uh, obstetrics and gynecology uh, practice. Um, uh, we are doing, among other things, vaginal births after C-sections, which um, uh, some of the uh, other local uh, OBGYNs uh, t tend to uh, prefer not to do. Uh, 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 mothers that are classified as high risk pregnancies uh, historically have left town uh, to get their care generally in West Palm Beach. Um, we're, we're offering those or will be offering those services here. Um, uh, we have uh, maternal fetal medicine uh, now, exciting new developments there. Uh, modeled after the program uh, in the, uh, the the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio, uh, specialists and pulmonologists are going to be coming here from Cleveland uh, to help us run our program and care for women uh, with those high risk pregnancies. Um, uh, in our in our heart program, uh, we have an electrophysiology lab that is now up and running, and we're very excited about that. Uh, uh, performing cardiac ablations among other services. Um, 
we've uh, opened our comprehensive stroke program. Uh, since last fall, we've done hundreds of thrombectomies uh, and are well on our way to building that program out. Uh, we have a new neuroendovascular surgeon uh, who will soon be joining Dr. Miller. Um, we've uh, uh, opened a concierge practice um, uh, based in the Family Health Center. It's growing and uh, is a great model for those who want personalized medicine. And I mentioned the use of robotics earlier. We've expanded the use of robotics for male urological procedures. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we're, we're, we are um, working very closely uh, with the athletic directors of Indian River State College, uh, as well as all of the St. Lucie County schools. And um, uh, I'm, I'm, I, I could not be more pleased uh, that, that we've been able to come together and, and offer um, a, a wide array of facilities uh, to, to those schools. Um, uh, we're establishing best, helping establish best practices for COVID mitigation. We're providing trainers, rehabilitation, and medical services to athletes. And uh, just incredibly excited about the uh, affiliation that we formed with both Indian River State College and the St. Lucie County School District. And, and excited about the, um, how we can provide uh, uh, great health care for, for the young men and women uh, who um, uh, attend those schools and compete athletically. Um, Florida Research and Innovation Center, wow. Um, uh, it was established officially in November of 2019 uh, to advance innovative translational research. And uh, from the beginning, the plan was to focus on immuno-oncology and infectious diseases. And it turns out that includes COVID-19. Um, in April of 2020, in close uh, affiliation with Cleveland Clinic's new Global Center for Pathogen Research and Human Health, uh, we brought together some of the world's top research experts in virology, immunology, genomics, and population health uh, to help us better understand emerging pathogens. pathogens. Uh, that includes the Zika virus and SARS-CoV-2, which causes COVID-19. Um, and we're trying to expedite the critically needed treatments and vaccines. Uh, in, in doing that, uh, next slide, please. We, um, uh, we are very privileged, and, and I saw that she's joined us on this call. Uh, Dr. Michaela Gack um, is the scientific director of the Florida Research and Innovation Center. She joined us um, uh, in July of this year. Uh, previously, she was a professor, as I said, of uh, microbiology and the chair of the Committee on Microbiology at uh, the University of Chicago. Um, and she is a renowned virologist and has an extensive background in microbiology and infectious disease. Um, and I went through her credentials earlier. I will not belabor the point, uh, but I, I, I will say this. I've had the privilege of meeting her. She is, uh, in addition to being a brilliant scientist, a, just a delightful person. I know that as you get to meet her in her time in our community, you will enjoy that very much. And we are very honored to have her as a remarkable scientific director for the Florida Research and Innovation Center. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Gack. Well, thank you so much for the kind introduction. It's really a pleasure to be here to give you an update on the Florida Research and Innovation Center, or FRIC, how we call it. Um, you know, I just started here in July, but I can tell you, you know, since this center has been acquired in November, um, over the past several months, we have really come already a long way in activating the research, also compliance structures, and it's, again, a um, great pleasure to give you an overview of what we have achieved and, and what we are planning, of course, uh, for the next, you know, years to come. So. For everyone who doesn't know the center very well, it's in Port St. Lucie. It's about a hundred thousand square feet research center, which is really state of the art in terms of lab and support spaces. What is a major asset of the center is really the high level biocontainment facility. So we have so-called biosafety level two, but also biosafety level three biocontainment facilities for biosafety level three which means that we can effectively and safely handle various viral agents, including sars coronavirus 2 the COVID-19 virus is one of the agents that needs to be handled, 
in a biosafety level three level. And I was told and I've learned over the past several weeks that there are very few biosafety level three containment facilities. First of all, in the United States, I already knew that, but in Southern South Florida, there's actually none which can handle airborne biosafety level three agents. So we're really perfectly suited for the safe uh, conduct of uh, infectious disease work. We have been developing also shared resource facility that could be used not only by the scientists here at the Frick, but also by various scientists, including um, precision scientists. They are in flow cytometry, imaging, bioinformatics. We have established a vivarium, and we are currently establishing a select agent program. Next slide, please. So what have accomplished over the past several months we have recruited um, several key personnel for research, but also for our shared resource facilities as well as administration. So we are really up and running in all these various entities. We have activated um, research laboratories that uh, implies my own lab. I should maybe mention that I moved with all my PhD scientists from the University of Chicago to Port St. Lucie. So my complete lab is here. In addition, and, and very importantly, the lab of Chei Zhang, who is the director and the chair of the cancer biology department at LRI of Cleveland Clinic in Ohio, part of his lab are also here at the Frick. And I can tell you that we have already established a search committee to recruit multiple uh, faculties or staff scientists who bring, you know, will bring, we expect their own lab to um, expand our research um, here at the Frick. We have activated these high level biocontainment facilities and, and thereby also established um, various compliance structures that really control that everything what we are doing is safe and is, you know, um, allowed and permitted the protocols and the agents we are working with. Next slide, please. You can see some of the pictures. So they have been really take, been taken here at the Frick, the Biosafety Level 2 program. We handle various viruses, very um, relevant for Florida, various mosquito transmitted viruses we are studying. These include dengue, Zika, West Nile virus, and then also um, BSA-3, our program. These are also pictures taken actually when the training was conducted. So now also the PhD scientists have been trained uh, for the biosafety level three work. And there we are currently mainly working on SARS coronavirus 2, so the COVID-19 virus. We are planning ahead a uh, work also on some tick-borne viruses um, that uh, need to be handled in a biosafety level three um, facility. So you might wonder what kind of research are we planning here? What are we already conducting? What are we planning for the future? So the Frick, the overall mission is really to do translational as well as basic research on the one hand on infectious diseases, but also on cancer. And what is really a related discipline for both infectious diseases as well as for cancer is immunology or immunotherapy. It's the immune system that controls on the one hand infectious diseases, but also the immune system is very important to control cancer. And maybe many of you know, there are many you know, therapies that relate to immunology, we call it immuno-oncology, that, that are very you know, state of the art for the treatment of various cancers. We certainly envision to have a very, very tight collaboration with all the clinical operations here with the various hospitals here in Florida of Cleveland Clinic, as well as of course in Ohio up there and, and the whole enterprise of Cleveland Clinic worldwide, as well as also other regional, national and international academic institutions. Um, just to name two of them, which are here in the region. This is of course Florida International University Maybe you know the Torrey Pines building, which is right next to the Frick, um, now uh, is part of FIU. We are also closely collaborating with the Scripps Institute in, in Jupiter. Um, our research that's very important to us should be really or is tailored to the needs of the region. So we are working on various viral agents that are really urgent to Port St. Lucie, to the whole Florida region and the southern part of the United States. And these are, of course, currently uh, COVID-19, but also importantly, various mosquito transmitted viruses that uh, still, you know, occasionally, but still, um, you know, almost every year cause outbreaks, um, dengue, 
sometimes in the Miami, you know, uh, Dade area, but also, you know, Sika, there have been in the past, you know, uh, outbreaks or problems here. Um, as well as, of course, we are working on, uh, you know, infectious diseases as well as cancer that are of global importance. So which research programs have we already activated? And this is really starting from July, so it's now exactly three months um, that we, we have activated the research. So we have many different research avenues on COVID-19. Uh, many of them are together with investigators at the LRI in Ohio. We have research currently ongoing on how this virus interacts with the immune system. Maybe you also know the human immune system. The problem is actually very often that it's kind of overactive, causes thereby inflammation and tissue and lung damage. So we are really investigating the molecular details, how that works, why is, this, why is the human immune system overreacting and causes a tissue damage. But we also are working on multiple and testing some of the vaccine candidates, um, some of newly developed one, newly designed by people at LRI and Cleveland Clinic, as well as others in, in various models here. We have active research programs on mosquito transmitted viruses. I already mentioned that Zika, Dengue and West Nile virus. We are working, I also mentioned that uh, briefly, really looking into the human immune response and the pro-inflammatory response, what triggers this overactivation of the immune response and inflammation and organ damage during some of these respiratory viruses, for example. A completely different, I call it beast of viruses than what we know from COVID-19 are so-called tumor viruses. Maybe you know um, about 20% of human cancers are caused by viruses, most well known as human papilloma virus, but also there are certain herpes viruses, certain viruses that infect uh, the liver, such as hepatitis C virus that can cause cancer. So we also have established programs here on some of these tumor viruses and how they cause cancer in, in human cells and how they trigger you know, these human cells to become tumor cells. Another very important research program is that is really close to my heart and I think maybe one of my life goals is to come up with broad spectrum antiviral therapies. Maybe to explain that a little bit over the past decades, the traditional approach to a virus has been always, we wait until the virus comes and then we develop an antiviral against the virus. That's what we see now with COVID-19. That has of course various problems meaning first of all time we, so we always play this catch-up game first the virus emerges and then we develop antivirals and we however um, are currently working on ways to target multiple different viruses that could be used also for newly emerging viruses if they belong to a certain viral family. So all these viruses even newly emerging viruses belong usually to a very well-known virus family as you know, COVID-19, the virus are coronaviruses. Other research programs are here, again, on vaccines and how to make them stable, more stable and more effective. This is, for example, done by Jay Jung's lab. And we also have a small program in my own lab on rare genetic diseases and how we can come up with novel therapies for them. Next slide, please. A little bit about, you know, what is also very important for the Port St. Lucie area, but also, you know, here the area in Florida. What about job, jobs and job creation? That's very important. The Frick, of course, besides all the wonderful research I told you about, it will create, I mean, we expect, you know, many jobs. Our aim is to at least have 100 um, job creations over the next five years. That's a minimum what, what we have as our goal. So we have currently, again, this is only from July until now, we have currently 18 employees, but the projection for the next year, 21, is to have a minimum of 33 employees, but that does not even include any faculty recruits. I, I told you that we have an established, you know, research committee to look for these faculty. We have just made the first offer to one of the faculty so we expect um, if we include these 33 employees or non-faculty plus the new faculty that will be coming, we will be around 40 employees by the end of uh, 2021. So these are the numbers of projections. What about collaborations? This I think is very unique and very important also to us for infectious disease work, but also work on cancer. 
to really you know work we do here the basic and translational research but we would want to have you know really translating this research from the bench how we call it to the bedside and this is really very unique that the frick is surrounded by multiple you know cleveland clinic hospitals so we really plan and envision to work very closely together with with the medical doctors and physicians we have, for example, one collaboration um, with Dr. Santirme at the Tradition Hospital and just, just received a donation for that for glioblastoma research. But also what I mentioned, we are extensively collaborating with Ohio Cleveland Clinic and the LRI and have submitted, these numbers are not even up to date. We have multiple more submitted grants now. I can tell you that almost all grants are currently on COVID-19 um, and many of them to the NIH. Um, and then I mentioned two major partners here in the region, besides the hospital, of course, and that is what I've already mentioned, FIU and the Scripps Institute in Jupiter. I have, you know, talked um, with both sides, with the leadership. We have, uh, with FIU, already shared facilities agreement with the Torrey Pines building. We are planning or, uh, on adjunct professorships and also even shared uh, training programs for um, graduate students, maybe undergraduate students. So this is currently being discussed. And with this, I would like to um, end and I am very happy to, if there's time to take any questions. Thank you. Thanks for Thank having you, me. Doc. Thank you, Dr. Gack. And, and um, uh, we, we are going to open it for questions. I um, do want you, uh, I'm sure many of us that are all in this meeting, uh, go back to uh, the the early days of uh, the VGTI building. In fact, I go back before that, uh, as I was the lawyer for the organization, we tried to get permission to build a hospital in tradition. Uh, one of the arguments we made was that if we did that, we could attract uh, organizations um, uh, like uh, uh, VGTI and Torrey Pines and others. Um, and and we are seeing now with the collaboration between Torrey Pines and, and FIU and the Cleveland Clinic, uh, uh, it's actually coming into existence. I think the vision, the dream that many of us had uh, well over a decade ago is, 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 is coming to pass. Um, uh, suffice it to say, when I talked to Dr. Iannotti, who is, is, uh, continues to be the chief of staff and the head of uh, both education and research for Cleveland Clinic Florida, um, uh, we're both uh, in agreement that uh, so far this is exceeding even our highest expectations. Uh, but we would um, we would be pleased, Dr. Uh, Patrick, Dr. Geck, and I would be happy to answer any questions that anybody has. I generally demand that somebody ask me a question. <laughs> <laughs> Rob, this is Jen. Unfortunately, we do not have any um, questions in the chat room at this time. Okay, well, I, I uh, appreciate that very much. Thank you so much. And um, uh, I guess at this point, then we'll turn it back over to you, Pete. Thank you, Rob. Uh, I would just like to offer um, my congratulations to uh, Dr. Gack and uh, offering on behalf of the EDC a very well, warm welcome to Port St. Lucie. I know everyone enjoyed uh, Dr. Gack's presentation. Sorry, Pete, Pete, I apologize. Uh, there was a question that just popped up in the in the chat room. I, I will stop and we will take that, that question. Okay. Dr. Gack is still on the line. Sorry, Peter. Anthony Boletto with uh, Boletto Associates here. Hi, Dr. Gack, and uh, welcome to the area. I'm also a Chicago transplant. Um, you had mentioned the short-term goals, and they're they're wonderful and very ambitious. Um, and uh, we are certainly grateful to have you here in our community. Uh, I was wondering uh, if any thought had been given to uh, some of the longer. And, and by the way, the growth is is going to be, um, you know. Uh, Great, uh, but where do you see the the program in the um, uh, the, the center um, five to ten years from now versus the shorter term? How do you see it developing? Um, what is your goal or vision for that um, in the longer term? That's a good question. Um, thanks for asking that. I think the overall goal is 
still to continue certainly the work on infectious diseases that's that's one goal um i know now of course COVID 19 is all the attention of us and in infectious diseases but believe it or not we keep you know need to be on top of infectious diseases because every virologist would agree this won't be you know the last outbreak uh, hopefully the last pandemic for a while at least but you know we really what i mentioned the goal is to come up with broad spectrum antivirals. So if a new virus emerges, we have a ready to use antivirals and don't need to go through that whole you know, procedure and exercise what we have done here. That's one goal. But importantly, I mentioned on the slides is really cancer and oncology. So I can tell you, I'm not an oncology. Um, that's not necessarily my, my background. We have been working on some tumor viruses, but let's say non-tumor driven cancers. This is, I can tell you, and I'm speaking also on behalf, let's say, of uh, Dr. Ian Nordi. This is really a major, you know, mission and goal for um, the Frick to expand and to recruit in oncology. Why is this important? We have fantastic, you know, work uh, ongoing in the clinics about, you know, meaning treating cancer patients, but to really come up with new, completely new. Nowadays, we believe it's immunotherapies. They are very promising, new immunotherapies for cancer. We really need to have basic and translational research because only basic and translational research will come up with completely novel or new ideas how to treat cancer. But on the other hand, basic and translational research also has a limit. We, we don't have, we don't typically see patients and you know can uh, basically translate what we have found on the bench, you know, into patients. And therefore, I think this is really a major mission, oncology work and really translation translation of our work here, finding molecular targets into the clinic, creating new early phase trials for, you know, some of the most, um, let's say, horrific cancer, some of them are incurable to really come up with new therapies. So these, I would say, still infectious diseases will be always you know, really present and important globally, but also for the Florida region, as well as really oncology and translating what we have here into the into the clinics and working, you know, with the wonderful hospitals of Cleveland Clinic together very closely. Thank you, Dr. Day. We had another question about the timeline for OBGYN and maternal fetal medicine. Dr. Petri, would you like to take that? Thank you, Rob. So we currently do have Dr. Lisa Kusno and Kira Di Gregorio, who's a nurse midwife, that are currently working in a clinic at Flor at the Family Health Center on Canner and Indian Street, as well as an office in Tradition Hospital in Health Park Two. Uh, they're currently seeing uh, OBGYN patients there. Uh, we do plan to hire at least a, another physician within the near term. We're talking about hopefully before the end of this year. And then potentially a third physician by the time uh, 2021 rolls around. Uh, maternal fetal medicine is actually um, up and running right now at Tradition Hospital. Uh, Dr. Jeff Chapa from Cleveland Clinic, Ohio, Dr. Amy Merlino from Cleveland Clinic, Ohio are two of the maternal fetal med medicine doctors that are working through our Tradition uh, Hospital and Tradition Office. And so um, they are currently taking patients and uh, they're assisting, they're being assisted right now actually by our OB laborists. So we have uh, obstetricians that are in the hospital 24 seven available to uh, assist in high risk pregnancy deliveries, but then also to uh, triage and to check any uh, OB patients that come into the hospital for any reasons. And so we're currently doing that at both North Hospital and Tradition. Thank you so much. Uh, Rob, this is Amber Bachelor. I'd love to just quickly speak to Dr. Petri. I'll be quick. Um, so thank you so much. That was my question. And I'm Amber Bachelor. I'm the director of the Women's Business Center at uh, Florida Tech. We are really excited as we're expanding with the population of women in business we're working with in St. Lucie County. We'd love to have a conversation with someone on your team about how we can expand the information about this expansion that you all are working on to the women in the community that we serve because we absolutely need your services so thank you well thank you very much if um you want just uh, get in touch with rob and uh 
we can connect via email and we'd be more than happy to maybe come out and do a presentation there or even uh, give you guys information from Dr. Cousineau's office. Perfect, thank you. And I'm not sure either, either Candy or Jen can get, can get you my information if you don't have it and, and um, we'll, we, we'd love to connect with you. Um, there was another question about um, uh, the challenges regarding quality workforce in the area. Uh, and and I'd, I'd like to take that one. Um, right now in, in the United States, there's a national shortage of licensed healthcare uh, uh, professionals, um, uh, uh, nurses, uh, technicians that work in all aspects of the organization, whether it's laboratory or imaging or, or what have you. Um, we've worked very closely with Indian River State College uh, to, to, uh, uh, to provide a local supply line of that talent and other, any other educate and Kaiser uh, as well. Uh, the, the, the very, very closely with, with Kaiser. Um, so, but we, we continue to face that. And I, again, our colleagues uh, at the other uh, hospitals in the community, I'm, I'm confident would, would indicate the same thing. We're, we're constantly looking for uh, uh, new talent, particularly as we, uh, we, we span, expand. I'm, um, uh, I'm excited about the future, but I think that's one of the biggest challenges we face not just locally, but as a nation, um, as my generation, that baby boomer generation uh, uh, gets old, we need more and more health care. I'm worried that you young folks aren't going to be there to take care of us. Um, so <laughs> if, you have, if you have children, encourage them. Uh, it's, a, it's, a good, it's, a, it's a good field to go into. You can earn a good living. Um, uh, also, uh, 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 there was a comment that was sent to me that I, I just want to touch on. And I appreciate uh, our member bringing it to my attention. Um, uh, but, but we have uh, uh, a partnership uh, with Florida Blue uh, for the new Truly Health, uh, uh, Truly for Health pro uh, product that they have. And um, uh, so we're, we're excited about that opportunity for local businesses uh, to get health insurance. Um, any other questions? Rob, Chris Anofsky here. Yes, Chris. Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, it's been uh, a little more than a decade since the National Institutes of Health has been funded at a significant level. Um, here we are faced with a pandemic, uh, first in 100 plus years, and we're seeing additional cancers and other infectious uh, diseases uh, on, on, on our doorstep. Uh, is there any indication that the legislature, the state, and or specifically the federal government uh, is looking to begin to fund properly uh, the real and consistent science that we need uh, from today and going forward. Well, I, I, I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Gack in just a second. I will say, first, I will echo your sentiments that the reductions in funding for that were poorly timed. I think that's uh, been demonstrated now. Um, uh, and we do, uh, th this country has, is responsible for most of those developments, uh, many of the developments anyway, that have occurred over uh, the, the last several decades, and, and it, it'd be a shame to see us back away from that. Uh, but Dr. Gack, do you have any observations on what we've seen in terms of funding trends, particularly out of the federal government? Yes, yeah. so far, of course, the NIH has tremendously increased, um, you know, as you know, the funding. Currently, you know, we are still uh, talking, you know, here with the state of Florida, um, we haven't uh, seen any, you know, increase in funding. Of course, every state, you know, they have had many, you know, economic lo or overall losses, so due to the pandemic, I can tell you know when I talk uh, to, I mean, be it NIH or Florida, I think especially for Florida, it would be so important to consistently fund infectious diseases, and I can tell you why. Why Florida? Florida has an overproportional, you know, elderly people. The people are older generally, and I can tell you that many infectious diseases, especially respiratory not even have to look at COVID-19 that anyway, but even, you know, the flu. The flu, you know, especially in, let's say, um, the age population, let's call it like that, where typically the immune system is just weaker. That's natural. That's completely natural. With COVID-19, it's a little bit a different situation because the immune system overreacts. But for all other infectious diseases, usually it's, you know, weaker. So it's very important to continuously, you know, fund uh, Florida. Another aspect, Florida is a wonderful place to visit for, you know, vacation. It has a lot of tourism 
and that is also while certainly you know wonderful i'm not saying anything negative about it but of course it brings some risk that you know diseases can come into florida and the last thing what i've already mentioned are mosquitoes the warm weather it's florida but it's also texas and other you know warm they will be continuously you know mosquito transmitted uh, diseases that i think needs really a continuous um attention i think by the by the government of florida because they will always be around they will you know come up and emerge like we had zika 2015 and 16 which you know lucky to us didn't make it you know may, had a big outbreak here only very small ones but yet you know mosquitoes uh, they are mobile that can change you know that can change quickly yeah I could not agree more strongly with Dr. Yak and and uh, and I think the sentiment that Chris was also expressing and appreciate your leadership on that issue, Chris. Um, the, um, uh, the the situation I think that the state of Florida is in the message that I would take to Tallahassee and I think we if we could all do it, it would be more powerful. And that is that that finally the state is actually positioned to do that which we hoped to do about a decade ago or so. Um, and and I, I know this sounds uh, uh, self-laudatory. I don't, uh, and I apologize for that. But I think the Cleveland Clinic and its uh, worldwide reputation for research, we, you know, we have an anchor that we can build this around, and the state can build around, uh, along with Scripps and, and and the other organizations that are in Florida. So, uh, for if Florida were to invest, as as Dr. Gack alluded to, Florida faces some very significant. Uh, budgetary challenges, and we know that. Uh, but as we look to the future, uh, if we want to have an economy that is a, uh, a clean economy, one that uh, uh, you know, first we, we we can we can help protect the world and provide great uh, uh, great service to 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 our, our fellow human beings, and at the same time uh, enrich our community with people that earn a good living, uh, that uh, you know are, are well educated, and that, that come to we bring a lot of other things to a community uh, beyond just good paying jobs, um, then we should we should focus, I think, on, on the opportunity that we have in front of us. I could not be more excited. I'm, I'm confident that with or without um, uh, the state support will be successful, uh, but there is an opportunity for the state to do something very, very special if it can invest in it. Rob? Yes. Hi, this is uh, Councilman Caraballo. I just wanted to uh, just briefly thank you for your leadership at the EDC. Um, and I want to thank all of our partners at Cleveland Clinic. Um, as many people know, it's been a dream of the city of Port St. Lucie to be able to see the VGTI turn into a premier biotech research center. And the partnership with uh, Cleveland Clinic has been so important. And we are so grateful to have you here. I, am, I, I was excited to hear about this update. Um, it's excited to. I'm very excited to see what's happening. I'm excited to share it uh, with our with our community in the future going forward. And this is just the beginning. I know there's many great things to come, and you know you can count on our partnership with the City of Port St. Lucie to help you any way we can uh, moving forward. I personally will be able. To, I, I will be willing to advocate um, in support of of any funding that you may need grant wise. But thank you so much, and um, and to all of our partners on this call. But we're I'm thrilled. Well, Jolene, I, first I, I want to thank you. You've you've been a champion from the very beginning uh, on this. Um, uh, I, I can't thank your, you enough for your support of of, of what we're trying to accomplish. Um, and um, uh, we're, we're we're just very very excited and and, and glad. I know we are all glad. Um, uh, many people probably don't know this. I didn't make a big deal about it. Uh, I was on the board of VGTI. I was the only local representative on that board. And I resigned from that board uh, probably about a year before, maybe a little less, around a year before it went under uh, because I just, it, 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 it didn't sit well with me and I, and I needed to, uh, uh, I felt like I did what I needed to do, but um, that that weighed heavy on me that there wasn't anything I could do about that at the time so that I can be a part of the solution is very exciting for me. But uh, the fact that when we came before the city of Port St. Lucie and before the county commission uh, in St. Lucie County, uh, the Cleveland Clinic was welcomed with such uh, open arms and, and welcomed to the community made all the difference in the world. 
uh, and then when the opportunity for uh, the the uh, this to become the Florida Research and Innovation Center came along, that relationship that had been established with local government officials, both at the city and the county level, um, uh, was was just critical uh, to the to the Cleveland Clinic wanting to make this investment, the first major investment in research that they've ever made outside of Northeast Ohio. Uh, except there, there's a there's a mental health facility out in, in Las Vegas, but um, uh, so I, I congratulate you and and Chris and and, and the other local elected officials who who, who, who um, uh, stepped out with on that limb with us and said we're we're behind you 100%. We're uh, I, I I believe uh, that that as time goes on 20 30 years from now people are going to look back and say this is one of the greatest things to ever happen in our community. Um, I, I, I firmly believe that. Uh, any other questions? We we have kind of run out of time, but I think do I turn this back over to you, Pete? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, thank you, Rob, and uh, appreciate uh, the presentations that Dr. Petrie and Dr. Gack made. And uh, I'd also like to um, share my absolute delight in seeing the VGTI building repurposed and retooled and. Uh, Jolene, thank you for your vision and leadership on City Council making this happen with Cleveland Clinic Florida. This this is certainly a historic event for Port St. Lucie and St. Lucie County. Um, 2020 and going into 2021, um, got to be some exciting years ahead for our community. So thank you to all of you. Uh, as Rob mentioned, we're running out of time, uh, but a couple of important uh, announcements. Uh, the EDC, in partnership with our title sponsor, Southern Eagle, and our partners at the PGA Golf Club, is planning its sixth annual Leaders on the Links Golf Tournament. Unfortunately, along with other changes in 2020, we don't believe we'll be able to host our Thursday evening reception. So we're going to pivot slightly in, in the format and uh, make it a, it's still a very enjoyable uh, functioning golf tournament and get together. Um, Candy's got all the details and we'll share it with you later, but we think that you're going to have so much fun on the golf course that you won't think you're playing golf. So we'll hope you'll stay tuned for the details. Uh, November 20th, um, all you have to do is go on to youredc.com for uh, sponsorship and other details. One other uh, important announcement is uh, EDC Excel has worked with Phil Van Hoosier to present Leaders Ought to Know, a 12-month on-demand e-learning management training curriculum that gives future leaders critical insights and instructions for successfully leading, motivating, communicating, and building engaged high-performance teams. Uh, the virtual program begins November 2nd, and we invite you and staff to participate in this leadership development program presented by Van Hoosier and Associates. Uh, $25 per person, and it is a great value. We have uh, already uh, 14 participants with ED Excel, EDC Excel. Um, go to your EDC and the November calendar for additional information. Also, I would like to share with you that if you have not seen our mid-year report for the EDC, that is also on our homepage. If you click on reports and studies and click on the year 2020, you can see all the uh, dynamic things that have occurred in St. Lucie County over the last six to eight months. And with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, that completes uh, our first virtual EDC luncheon. And if there's any uh, comments that you have, Rob, um, I'll let you uh, adjourn the meeting, sir. Thank you very much, Pete. I'd like to thank everybody for attending. I'm sure we'd appreciate feedback uh, through whatever mechanism is, is most convenient for you uh, on whether or not you found this valuable. We, uh, Pete, nine yeah. others are talking about this. Um, we're just, uh, you know, felt like we needed to try and do something to get back to some sense of normalcy and and I uh, hope you found the information useful and and uh, you picked up something here that you you have value in. But we thank you so much and uh, uh, but we are adjourned. Thank you again and have a great day.
Thank you.